Okay. So uh, let's move to our next uh, keynote speech that will be given by Sarah Kurtz. Uh, Professor Sarah Kurtz has been working for uh, at the Solar Energy Research Institute of the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, United States, for more than 30 years. She's uh, very well known for her contributions on the development of multi-junction solar cells on CPV and PV performance, reliability, and many other topics on photovoltaics. Uh, she has several prizes. I think she shares one with uh, Antonio Lucchi, the Sherry Award. I'm not sure I'm wrong. And uh, many others. And a couple of years ago, she transitioned to a faculty position at the University of California at Merced while continuing with uh, NREL. And uh, we've asked her to uh, share her vision of what are the challenges that PV research has uh, ahead. So, Sarah, the floor is yours. So it's my deep honor to join you here today. Um, those of you who know me well know that I have followed the concentrator PV industry for many years, and so it's been a special pleasure to read the many papers that have come out of the Institute over the years and to visit the laboratory. Um, I, I visited Gabriel Sala's lab, laboratory a few years ago to see the simulator that's a unique capability that no one else in the world has. So they, I really um, view this institute as leading the world in the, the topics that it's undertaken. So it's a real honor to join you here today. Um, I was given the, the, top, the title of Challenges in Photovoltaic Research and I wanted just a kind of spoiler alert here. I'm, I'm going to undertake to talk about the challenges. Often when we get together, it's a really good time to celebrate, which we have a lot to celebrate. But we also need to, to keep up the, the work if we want to continue on our great path of celebration. And so I'll, I'll, have some, I'll talk about some of the more difficult things that we have in front of us in addition to the things that um, are successes. So I've added the title here of we're adjusting to an empty nest. So um, I'm at an age where my children have both grown up. I remember when they were babies and my job was taking care of them. Now um, my son has a, a PhD and is married and has, has a job. My daughter's in graduate school and getting close to getting her degree. And so we have what we call an empty nest that we my husband and I now live by ourselves. But we still have a role with our children, but it's a different role. And I, some parents, for me, it's been actually a very pleasant um, change in role. But what I found was over the years talking with the people, um, the researchers, when the, when the researchers are successful, at some level, you could say, well, we should celebrate our <coughs> success and move on to the next thing. But for some researchers, it's a real identity crisis. And I think it is just as it is an identity crisis for some parents that when their children leave home, now the role that they've had of nurturing their children um, is kind of gone. If, if they continue to treat their children as they did when they were little, the children probably get really upset with them. Um, they need to treat them now as an adult. And so the question is, as research laboratories, how do we transition to working with PV more as a mature, grown-up technology. It still has a long way to go to grow up. I view it as you know, maybe emerging from college at this point. Um, do we see then what, how we redefine our, our relationship with the industry? So um, with that said, I'll be starting here first um, to talk a, a little bit about solar, how solar has grown up. Um, you've seen in the previous um, presentation very similarly it's been quite spectacular, the growth. And so for years, we've talked about a dollar a watt modules, that we have an idea of how we can get to a dollar a watt, and now that question's pretty irrelevant. So what do we do next? So that's what I'll be talking about. And I'll, I'll have two primary um, themes to talk through today. One is um, bringing the PV to the terawatt scale. I think there is a whole new set of research topics there. Um, which actually the Institute here is well positioned to tackle. And then also, I think there's still opportunities to continue the kind of PV research that we've done historically, and I'll give you some examples of that. And then in the end, I'll try to give you perspective of what I see it will take to actually 
um, make that new technology be useful. Um, so we saw um, in the previous pre presentation how Antonio Luque had predicted the most optimistic curve being somewhat shy of what's actually happened. Here we have some of the projections. So the historically, the solar industry has grown much faster than what was predicted. And this has been a wonderful um, success story, one that we can all celebrate. And indeed, if we look here, we have on the logarithmic graph, the world electricity generation as a function of year. And you can see that solar and wind have been growing quite rapidly. And if you just extend those growth curves into the future, what you find is that the total electricity for the whole world will be comparable to the amount of solar if we could manage to sustain this same historical growth curve. And this comes in something like the year uh, 2025, or at least by the year 2030, where really, if we could sustain our current growth rate, we would be at a level where we're really powering the world. So this is, as, as Marco Topes just said, it's a new era for solar, and we have a new set of challenges to look at. So part of that is um, looking at electrification. I'll come back to that in a moment. While that curve shows the growth that looks so consistently getting bigger and bigger and bigger, if you look at it on a regional scale, you see that indeed um, pretty much every country has had their set of incentives and Spain had a very lucrative incentive program that very quickly maxed out and then ended very abruptly. We can't, as long as we have growth curves that look like this, the industry is, is at risk. And what's happened right now is that we've had new countries step in. China stepped in with an even bigger growth curve. And, but now China is on, on more on the, the stable or, or downward side of this. And the question is, what other countries can we get to step in? Or can we manage to get all of these countries to begin to have a more stable market? Until that transition occurs, we aren't really um, out of the woods, I would say. The fact that 2018 had about the same deployment level as 2017 um, is a, a real change for us if that continues. So we, we want to keep it going faster. But keeping in mind what, where we've gotten to now, I view as being a positive feedback loop. We started with enthusiasm for solar, which gave the favorable policy, which you saw in the previous slide, that the, the local programs have really enabled this global, global growth, the favorable policy, in motivated increased deployment, which enabled us to get to lower costs, which then gave more enthusiasm. And so this positive feedback loop, I think is really at the foundation of why we've been able to grow so fast. Um, the other key piece of that, obviously, as, as I note there, is the lower costs. And, and we saw a similar graph in um, previously, but. The key thing to think about here from a researcher's perspective is back in the um, you know, 10, 15 years ago, if you had an idea of how to get to a dollar a watt module, that was really exciting and the, and the funding agencies were all ready to, to fund that. Now if you present a proposal for a dollar a watt, people look at it and say, well, you know, modules don't cost that much now. Why should we pay you to develop something that's a dollar a watt? So this is the challenge that we've now um, encountered, that we've been so successful, and largely, uh, I have to confess, I think it's the Chinese have been very successful in getting the, the costs down so much. Um, but we've been so successful as a research community, uh, what will we be able to do next? So what to do? Um, obviously, the thing is tackle the next problem. The question is, what's the next problem? So there are many approaches, and um, after seeing all the presentations yesterday, I think that um, the institute here is very well positioned to be able to tackle some of these. And in general, I'm going to talk about them in two different groups. One is implementation of solar at the terawatt scale, and the other is more the next generation PV. And I've, I've seen, this is one of the, the key things I, would hope that all of us can actually look ourselves in the mirror and give ourselves an honest answer to. I had a group um, uh, one time on the, on the phone and I asked them the question, if you're trying to solve the problem with climate change, 
would you look more at doing fundamental basic research or would you look more at doing deployment? And being the researchers they were, they all said, of course, basic research is the answer. Well, if you look at the time frame, I'm going to show you in a graph coming up, it's very difficult to think of how we will get there. So I, I think that there is, I personally think that there's great value both in working to get to the terawatt scale very quickly, in fact, getting to the tens of terawatt scale very quickly. Um, and there's also a lot of value in working on next generation PV, but I don't think we should fool ourselves to say that working on next generation PV is what will um, prevent climate change from happening. So next I'd like to talk about the, the challenge of getting to the terawatt scale. So one way, if you're thinking of developing a research program, one question to ask yourself is, what does the world need right now? And this could be a very controversial question. I, I do mean my talk here to be a little controversial, to stimulate a little discussion. But I could um, assert here that if we take the historical growth rate, this is a logarithmic scale, if we take the historical growth rate of the annual shipments and essentially maintain that growth rate coming up to about the year 2030, and then just maintain that deployment rate after that. You can look at what the cumulative PV deployment would be, and we're getting into the range where we would be able to meet not only the electricity requirements of the world, but some of the energy requirements of the year, uh, of the world. And, but the, the thing to think about here is, if we develop a completely new technology, what technology do you think we could develop that would be able to ramp up fast enough to be able to contribute to be looking, contributing, say, a terawatt within the next 10 years? If you look at history, um, the perk cells that are now becoming very common in the deployment, the record efficiencies for those were set back um, 30 years ago, something on, on that order. Those, the, the technology was developed decades ago, and it's taken decades to get into the marketplace. I think that things happen faster now than they did over the years, and that a new technology now could be deployed faster. But if you think about even the risk of, if I have a new technology, first thing I want to do is to make a small amount of it, put it out in the field, and wait a year or two to see how it works. Um, if you immediately scale to a terawatt deployment, it could be possible business-wise in terms of the mechanics of making a, a factory that fast, but the risk associated with deploying that volume of material in such a short time when you have such little field experience is a higher risk than what most people will be willing to take. So um, I, the thing I'd like to underscore here, it's probable that we won't be able to maintain this growth rate. It's actually the challenge I see um, facing all of us. Could we maintain this? There's no reason from the industry's perspective, maintaining that growth rate would not be such a problem. Uh, we're not too likely to run out of silicon. Uh, we might need to decrease our use of silver and some other things, but being able to do this from the industry's perspective is not so difficult. The bigger question is, can we identify the markets? Um, and so I'll talk next about um, some of the challenges we have there. So here are the data for California. One of the reasons I was excited to move to California is because California really has been leading the world in terms of adopting um, renewable energy. And here you can see how the, the fraction of, of solar electricity, so the fraction of electricity generated in the state of California, the fraction of that that's solar, has been growing quite steadily, actually, until about the last year. And um, when I put this graph together recently, I was a little disconcerted. It's like, you know, we want this to keep going up, don't we want? Now, why has it stopped going up? Um, so the, the next slides, we have some of the challenge here. What you see here, is that on a spring day, the renewable electricity we get can sometimes get close to what the entire load is. And at that point, instead of normally, California is importing electricity from the nearby states. But at that point on, on this day in, in April, they were actually exporting because they had more electricity than they knew what to do with. And indeed, at those times, you end up with a curtailment where we just force the, the plants to be turned off. And I have been watching these data, and from um, 2016 to 2017, it had taken this 
increase, and, and this looked like, oh, this is a problem. And then from 2017 to 2018, there really wasn't much change. And I thought, oh, they figured it out. They're getting better at managing the grid so they don't have to turn off the solar plants so often. But then the next time I looked at this with 2019 data, it's clear that they don't have full control. What we hear, and that um, most of you have probably seen what the, we call the duck curve here, of if you take the net load, which would be the, um, the load and you subtract off the solar electricity from it, then this represents the amount of electricity that needs to be generated by the conventional plants. And if it's your job to sit here and as the sun is setting in the evening to turn on the other, cap uh, the other manufacturing or the other generation hardware, you have to ramp it up very quickly and in a very controlled way in order to match that, um, that curve. And this becomes a bigger and bigger challenge as the steepness of this curve. And you know, one question is what happens when the belly of the duck actually gets down to zero or goes negative? At that point, then we really have to do curtailment. There's no other option unless we've figured out how to generate more load at that time of day. So what's happening is that in the state of California, it used to be that when people put in a plant, they would sign maybe a 20-year power purchase agreement. The investor knew then what price they could get for the solar electricity over the course of decades. Now they're not signing power purchase agreements for that long a time, maybe 10 years. So if they sign an agreement for 10 years, then the question is of the investor in that project, what value will this electricity be 10 years from now? And the investors are looking at this curve and saying, hmm, the electricity that I can generate 10 years from now might actually have negative value and, or about zero value. So how am I going to recover the value of the plant? Why would I want to invest in a new plant if I'm not going to be able to sell the electricity because we're generating so much electricity call it covariance, that when the sun shines, all of the solar plants are generating electricity. When the wind blows, all of the wind plants are generating electricity. And so it's not like with um, the conventional plants that maybe you schedule maintenance or, or whatever at different times. Now you end up that when, it, when it's, um, the sun is shining, you have way more electricity and that's when you want to sell your electricity. And if it's not worth anything, then that's a problem. So this is a, a new challenge that the state of California is already experiencing. Once before, I, I asked the analysts at NREL to say, why was it that all of those markets went up and then down? And they went and I said, is it because we got to the point where we had so much solar that people didn't know what to do with the electricity? And the answer at that time was no, no. The answer there is that the incentive program got maxed out and the, the program was canceled or pulled or whatever and that's why the market's gone away. In the state of California now, this may be one of the first times we're seeing that the penetration level of solar is reaching the point to which it becomes a problem for managing the grid and that that's affecting the markets. So this is my um, description of what I call one, two, three approach to 100% renewable energy. We need the renewable electricity, as I just showed you, putting in more and more solar, more and more wind. But we also then need electrification. So we can run our cars off of electricity. We can heat our homes using heat pumps instead of natural gas. We can um, effectively run the world from electricity. And also then we need the flexible grid. And I, under the the, the category of flexible grid, I'm thinking of storage, I'm thinking of demand management. We heard some of that discussed yesterday. This is so important to be able to address the issue of the covariance of when the sun is shining that we have now more electricity. If we want to use solar to power the world, the question is, we need power at midnight as well as at noon, and how do we address the, the need for it at midnight? And so until we can figure out how to either shift those loads or get enough storage, we won't be able, we'll be limited to how much of our um, energy demand we can get. And so it's interesting to look at it from the California perspective that we're really getting there. Now I do have, um, I'm not going to show you today, but I have another set of slides that takes each of these red arrows to show, I talked before about the positive feedback. Each of these actually helps the other one happen faster. 
So if, for example, you have more electrification, it increases the demand for electricity, which enables us to install more renewable electricity sooner than we would um, if we didn't have that demand for electricity. And so each of these six arrows you can look at, and I really believe that if we as a community figure out how to do these three things in a balanced way, we will see the benefit of the positive feedback just as we did um, it previously to see solar grow faster. And so we as a community here typically focus much more on the, just the electricity generation, but um, uh, the presentation we saw yesterday on the, the distributed uh, grid and looking at balancing the, the demand side management and things begins to get into all three of these. And so I think the Institute here is actually well positioned to broaden the research to be able to look at the, the whole picture. If I look at how we're doing, I think that we're doing better with solar and wind deployment. Um, EV adoption, we could do more. We're doing actually fairly well in some countries and not so well in others. The heat pump adoption, there are a few countries, a, a few places in the world that's really moving um, to doing well with heat pump adoption, but I think there are a lot of places, like in the US, um, it's not very common for people to be thinking about that. There could be other, uh, other things. We're actually doing pretty well with the, the lithium ion batteries, um, time of use rates and other things we, we've made some progress on, but I think there's much more to be done. Um, I did want to share with you, before I left NREL, we did a, a, a process of talking about what research directions we should go to. I think every research organization does this sort of exercise every couple of years. And just before I left NREL, um, I led a workshop there, so I thought I'd share the results of that with you. Again, this is toward broadening our, our perspective of what research needs to be done. Um, here we're looking at our, our vision is unsubsidized solar electricity costs less than today's electricity, even at night. I think we do agree um, that the solar costs, at least in location, sunny locations like Spain, that the um, electricity, solar electricity prices have come way down. But if you look at trying to use solar electricity to give you um, around the clock electricity, I think the prices are not yet actually competitive with the, the conventional grid, at least not in many locations. Um, a second concept here is the PV is so cheap it can be used everywhere. And here we have the vision of if you have a surface, whether it's, it's the shingle of your roof or the tile of your roof or your window or whatever, can you put the PV there and then normally you may have a coating of a um, paint or something to protect the surface. Can we now just insert the PV and make it so cheap we can build it into everything, into our laptops, into our windows, into our, our tiles. Um, some people, I think it's a little bit uh, controversial about into our roads or into our sidewalks or whatever, but. Um, can we put it just everywhere? And then a third one is solar electricity can meet our broader energy needs, um, reducing our cost to power the whole world. And so this is looking at um, the electrification and either, even the, the um, solar the, um, to fuels or whatever. So underneath of all of those, you can look at some of the different um, research topics that can go. I'm not going to go into those at the moment in the interest of time, but um, we could come back to them if you'd like later. I'd like to talk then next about um, continued PV research. And so this is research that um, at some level I, I would guess that it's not going to be very helpful in ramping fast enough to meet the, the, the climate to change goals that we have. But I've, in the long term, it will be very useful to establish a photovoltaic um, a foundation to run the world on. Um, to give you some perspective here, I don't know how many of you have followed the work. Um, I, it was my privilege to work with Jerry Olson, but back in 1984, it was decided at that time, Jerry Olson had been working on purification of silicon, and he was essentially told point blank, you know, we already know how to purify silicon. You should just stop this and you should do something more useful. Well, it turns out that that decision led to his inventing the gallium indium phosphide gallium arsenide cell, which actually really changed the world in a, in a pretty substantial way. But I have to laugh about this because um, I, I think you all agree that in the last 30 years since that time, or, or 
whatever it's been, 25, um, the, we continue to see new um, increments in purification of silicon. And indeed, yesterday, we, we saw some slides talking about purification of silicon. There's an ongoing need to refine whatever processes we have. So um, I, I kind of laugh that back in 1984, we, we came to the conclusion that, um, that maybe we should be done with the silicon purification. But so 35 years from now, I think that people will still be optimizing things that we're debating today about are we done with this or should we keep working on this. We'll continue to, to do the, the refinement. So I wanted to talk today about um, one of the frontiers that I see. Um, and so I'm talking about building integrated PV. This has actually been pretty controversial. I haven't yet convinced the Department of Energy in, in um, the US that this should be a priority for them. They say it's a niche market and um, they're not really interested in funding it and I keep telling them that they should reconsider. But um, So maybe I'll convince all of you today when I haven't convinced them. Um, I, I do note a couple things. One is that generating electricity close to where people um, are will become increasingly important, especially as the population grows and the land becomes um, needed for um, a growing food and, and just a place for the people to be. Being able to use dual use, being able to put the uh, electricity straight on the buildings will be useful. I go back to give you the perspective on this. I go back in time to 1994, and I remember at the PBSC, I remember being there and hearing from um, Powerlight, they were rolling out this new product. Um, this, so this was back 1994. They had the vision that you could avoid the cost of the racking for a PV system and you'd avoid the cost of the shingles here. So you both have, by using the solar shingle, you both have a cheaper solar system and you have a cheaper roof. And so they rolled this out as this wonderful thing, the best thing since sliced bread, and everyone was very excited about it. But the thing is that, um, and they, they expect to see it grow, but what you see is that the data show that it um, BIPV, the building integrated PV, hasn't really taken over much of the market. Now we do, I want to be clear that the building applied PV, where you take a conventional module and put it on a rack on top of a roof, um, that has actually captured some significant fraction of the market. But the, um, in general, if we look at um, the centralized plants have taken over market share in recent years, and we don't really see the, the shingles or other things like that capturing very much of the market share. So what are some of the reasons why it didn't fly? Um, there are some business reasons. Electricians are paid more than roofers, so um, you, you want to um, have the, the cheap labor come and just put all the PV, uh, the, the, if, if you're going to do a roof, you want to be able to pay them the least amount. Um, it's not easy to scale this sort of thing to the gigawatt level. If you want to put out a gigawatt of PV, it's much easier to do 10, 100 megawatt plants than it is to, to assemble maybe a whole set of, of homes to add up to that number. Um, then, but there are also technical reasons. The, when you put the modules on the surface, they get hotter, which gives you a lower efficiency and faster degradation. You may have um, shading on the roof that gets complicated. I'll show you in the next slide a fun picture to show you um, how that works. It's also awkward to, to wire all of these. How do we do the interconnections? And we know that sometimes the fires that we see from um, PV systems often have to do with the wiring where you've interconnected the, the modules more so than the, the modules themselves. Um, now this is a picture that was taken um, at, in the Forestal building. This is at the Department of Energy has the system that they were commissioning. And you can see that the visual image with the caution flags here that are casting shadows along the, this, and this looks pretty harmless, right? Uh, most people don't think about caution flags as causing a hazard. But you can see that if you look at the infrared image, everywhere that there is a shadow, you see that you get a hot spot because of the, the shading of that. It puts it into reverse bias and therefore um, causes it to locally heat up. Um, when people do the reliability studies and try to predict the lifetime of the module, they're going to use the temperature 
that they calculate out here, they don't necessarily look at um, the temperature when it's shaded. But if you have a vent or something sticking up on the roof that shades the module in the same location every day when the sun comes across, you'll actually have that part of the module running hot every day. And how will that affect the performance of the module? You can see that the, the degradation rate may be very different when you have some shading. So this is just one small example of some of the problems that you run into if you begin to really do the um, BIPV in a serious way. So there are lots of different approaches. Actually, this has two approaches. There are lots of different approaches to um, doing one is to use somewhat conventional modules and build them into a structure that can then be the roof. Another is to build them straight into um, the whatever, in this case, the tile that would make the roof. And what I'll be talking about in the next slides is mainly more this approach where you build actually an active layer into the, the device itself. Um, here's an example of where people are actually already selling modules that go straight onto a surface as on this, this truck. Um, there are also people, um, this was taken actually in, in China advertising the, the solar windows. Um, Alta Devices is um, advertising the, the car with the, the, sh the cells built in or um, they're actually selling more the drones where you can build the module straight into the, the surface of the, the wing of the drone. Um, so the general concept here, if you want to do just a back of the envelope, this is a very crude calculation. If you think of now the conventional field of modules that we have, think about taking away the racks and the frames, take away the glass and the back sheet, take away the land acquisition and the preparation where you may be smoothing the land or whatever. Think about taking away the permitting. All of these costs, if you could get rid of all those costs, that's actually a significant fraction of the overall cost of the system. So if you think now of, you've already got a surface out there, whether it's the roof or a window or whatever, and probably that surface has some sort of protective coating. If you now can just insert the thin PV layer in between those, without adding much cost. Um, you can maybe then make whatever structure you have out there. This happens to be a picture of the Denver airport from a, um, a perspective for those living in, in Denver. This is a, a familiar view, maybe not so familiar from here. You can work through the numbers then. This is maybe um, one um, estimate of, at the system level, $1. ten per watt. And if you look at then getting rid of the frame you still have the cost of the cell, you still have the cost of the power electronics, but you may not have any racking or long wires, you may have reduced permitting costs. You may be able to get the cost of the PV down by something like a factor of three. So this is a vision of how you could do PV in a radically different way than what we do it now. And so just to, to dream a little, what if, what if the, the building integrated PV actually could reach a third of the cost of the ground mount PV? Um, I know that PV module prices per area now are comparable to the price of painting that area. If you went and hired somebody to paint this room and looked at the cost um, per square meter compared with the cost per square meter of modules, it's actually pretty comparable depending upon what you, your local labor rates are. So what if any product you could buy could be bought either with or without the PV with just the difference of that, that extra little added cost? Um, it, there, are, there are many markets out there that you could get into and the potential there is actually in, in the giga, gigawatt level in the, in the US and at the world, I think it's in the terawatt level. So one question is, what, what's different now if in 1994 products were rolled out that weren't successful, what would it be different now that would enable us? I mean, what, one of my questions about this was BIPV just a bad idea or was it an idea whose time had not yet come? Is it possible that doing some more research now we would end up with finding that this is the time when it could actually become a, a mainstream thing? Um, so PV is much bigger. We might actually be able to get the building industry convinced that it's the direction for them to go. We now have module level power electronics. It used to be that if you wanted to put PV windows in a, in a building, you would need to run wires around the building to wire them to a string inverter. 
And that actually was pretty much a hassle, but now you can use a microinverter there. And we also have the DC-DC optimizers that can mitigate some of these shading issues. Um, you also have strategies where we can reduce the effective temperature. And so this is a, a, a graph from um, a presentation, a, a paper from uh, Tim Silverman. Um, but my group now at, at, at the university is looking more at the, the Alta devices modules where you can see that the, the output of the gallium arsenide module hardly changes as the module temperature changes, whereas the, the silicon um, drops quite significantly. And um, there are multiple new techniques for integration of the solar cells. And then we have things like could the defect um, perovskite materials provide a new opportunity. So there are many um, scientific questions we could explore. What is the, the science behind um, making material devices at low temperature that are stable um, for decades? I think it's quite interesting to think about that we can paint the walls for something <laughs> with a process that we do at room temperature, yet that paint may actually last for decades. Could we come up with a way to make semiconductors Normally, we think of that if you can, you heat it up because of the activation energy, if you have a process, a diffusion process that occurs at, at one temperature, if you have the, the, um, the junction in the solar cell, if, the, if you make that junction at room temperature and then it sits at room temperature, you may find that diffusing around the, the structure of the solar cell then changes in a time frame that's unacceptable. If you can make it at 1,000 degrees, Celsius, and then you cool it down, then it's pretty much frozen in place. But are there fundamental things? What is it special about the process of painting or making epoxy that allows you to do that process at room temperature and end up with something that's stable? And could we somehow or other transfer those concepts over to solar cells? Um, other questions like, can we, can we maybe make those layers at higher temperature and then transfer them at very low cost? Could we think of um, a way we could effectively wrap the world in, in plastic solar cells just to make it, it be, in, and you see that um, Microlink is already working on getting the, the flexible um, solar cells there. There's also um, what coatings do we need to protect the PV that we could maybe replace the glass with just a thin coating instead of needing the thick rigid glass. Um, which PV materials? We want, want ones that are defect tolerant, stable, scalable, non-toxic, low cost. Uh, can we reduce the effects of the increased operating temperature? And what are the strategies for interconnecting in a thin uh, format so that we can just have a very thin layer um, that we put in? So um, next, I, finally, I'd like to, to talk just a little bit about what it will take so I think all of you, you, sh you saw this slide already. Um, there have been so many different approaches that have been taken. Um, but if you look at what's been in the commercial marketplace, here we have the, the silicon is the blue, the black, and silicon has really dominated the market. This is actually a fascinating graph to look at that um, during the time of the silicon shortage in the late uh, 2000s here, we had cadmium telluride growing to take over market share. But then once the silicon shortage problem was solved, since then, the thin film fraction of the market has um, shrunk. Not to say that uh, they've, the, 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 t the manufacturing itself has shrunk. It's actually grown, but its market share has shrunk. So it's clear that silicon has dominated the history of the, the commercialization of PV. Um, and it raises the question of can any technology catch up with silicon at this point? Um, so historically, I think um, many people had kind of written off silicon saying it'll never meet our cost targets. And we've had this debate um, about you know, the revolutionary versus the evolutionary. And I think that at this point, with the low prices we have for silicon modules, I think most of us would agree that it's become the evolutionary um, that we've shown that evolutionary can get us to some place that's useful. Um, but interesting here to think that even though silicon has been the dominant technology, we still see the details of what is being done in silicon shifting. And this year in particular, seeing the shift from the multicrystalline to the monocrystalline cells will be quite 
is a quite fascinating development in my um, perspective. Um, I think that using learning curves as a strategy for tracking technology and for projecting and identifying what's useful to invest in is a very interesting approach. And indeed here, we can see that one of the reasons that PV has done so well is that it's had this steep curve. If you look at, for example, comparing it to wind, mm -hmm. comparing it to solar thermal electric, the steeper slope enables it to get to um, a, a price range that is um, competitive. Certainly you don't want to be on the nuclear curve here. Um, so if you look historically, we've been able to follow this curve more or less. I mean, it, we could talk for a long time about this curve. We're actually currently below what the historical curve was. If you're thinking about a new technology, and so it, when I looked at this with CPV and said, I followed the CPV technology and I thought about today putting in a bunch of slides. I used to present slides about how CPV was the fastest growing technology out there, which it was on a relative scale at a certain time. But um, if you think about if it could be a factor of two lower and if you could now enter the market up, up here and now sell at a competitive price down here and then manage to duplicate the same slope. And I don't really know whether CPV would have the same slope or a steeper slope or a shallower slope. If we could figure that out, that would actually be really useful. But if we just assume it would have the same slope and look at how much you would have to sell at a loss in order to get down to compete with silicon, you're looking at billions of dollars that you would need um, to invest before you begin to get a profit back from your product. It becomes very difficult. So the question is, what is the strategy you can use now to catch up with silicon? And so um, I recently, I know that um, the, the price we heard yesterday quoted for Alta was substantially higher. My understanding is that they actually are, um, with the scale up in manufacturing they've been doing, are at lower prices than, um, than, than what we heard yesterday. But looking at about this being the current price and the current cumulative shipments, if gallium arsenide were able to follow the same curve by using niche markets or market entry markets. So for example, right now, they have a higher value because of the higher efficiency and the lighter weight, which is very valuable to the drone market. So people who are making these drones are willing to pay more for their technology. That gives them a way to enter the market, bring their costs down as they move down the learning curve. And if you look at other niche markets here and there, they could be on a pathway to eventually catch up with silicon without the need to sell at a loss early on. So my assertion is that a technology that has attractive features for entry markets can sell at a higher price and come down the learning curve. There may be other strategies for introducing a new technology if you can leverage and if it's similar enough to an existing technology, it may not be so bad. But um, with this sort of approach, I ask the question of, could gallium arsenide be successful? Are there other ones that we could look at? And indeed, um, an interesting one right today to look at is perovskites. It's um, definitely the darling of the industry, or of the research community at the moment. And indeed, I looked at, um, I did a search of looking at the number of papers published on perovskites just by doing a Google Scholar search for silicon solar cell and perovskite solar cell, which is a very crude analysis. But you can see that uh, we're looking at getting into a, a time frame when perovskite um, is actually generating as many publications as silicon um, for the solar cells. But the, the efficiencies have come up very quickly. But even though they've been reporting very high efficiencies, they tend to be for very small devices. And if you compare the perovskites with the other thin film technologies, and I may have missed some of the recent um, efficiency records because they, the perovskite people are, have been setting records very quickly here. But the thing here to keep in mind is there's a lot of excitement about the perovskites, but they actually haven't done anything that's really better than what cadmium telluride or SIGS has done historically. Um, but the interesting thing they have done now, Oxford PV is taking a very interesting approach with the 28% perovskite on silicon tandem, um, where they can just take now a, a standard silicon module and now by adding the extra coating onto the, the, the cell, maybe assemble one that's a higher efficiency, 
that should be able to now give them a feature, a higher efficiency module than any other technology out there, which enables them to sell at a higher cost and may give them the ticket to entering the market. Um, so just briefly, thinking about the role of a university R&D program, we really do want a university to be educating students on relevant topics. And um, my vision, I think all of you in this room have a vision that PV will um, be powering the world in the, in the decades to come. We want to make sure that at least some of the people around us really understand what's happening. So some of the things there, one is I encourage projects that study how good solar cells work. Um, it works much better to have um, people understand how a good solar cell works than um, how if you do it this way, maybe you can get um, a 2% efficient OPV cell instead of a 1% efficient. Um, and include study at the system level, understanding the reliability and, and things like that are, are very useful. Um, and who will do the new research that's needed on storage and system integration? It's, it's an interesting thing that a lot of researchers view their skill as having decades of experience and being able to understand the details of various uh, of their area of expertise, and so they're very hesitant to move into a new area. But if no one moves into the new area and there's a new area of research that needs to be done, question is how will we make progress there? So it's good actually that the institute here already has some people working on aspects of the system integration. So that gives a, a good opportunity here. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that we don't want to compete directly with the companies in general. It's very difficult in a university environment to keep up with the professional capability of the, the um, companies. And foundational to any research program is the funding source. So just some closing thoughts here. The challenges I see, PV has grown up leaving the research labs with an empty nest, and we need now for the research labs to redefine what um, we're thinking of as the role for the research. The companies are now ahead of the research labs in a lot of cases. How, do we, how does that affect the role we have? Companies have now gone to China, so if we want to partner with them, it becomes that much harder. Um, and a new PV technology may be difficult to implement. If you look, I didn't mention this, but if you look at that graph I made before, if we actually manage to ramp the production volume up by 2030, we would have a production volume. After that, we wouldn't really need to add more manufacturing capacity. So if you come up with a new technology in 2030 that's radically different, will you be able to get anyone to adopt it? You'll have to have very low capital costs because people will already have manufacturing capability and may not want to shut that down. So the opportunities, though, I see um, terawatt scale will require a whole new energy system. There are many research topics there to be able to create that. PV is here to stay. It's still in its infancy. It has still, well, I said before it was maybe at the college level, but you can um, catch me on my, my contradictions here. There's still lots to learn, and I've given you here today an example of the BIPV, uh, of some of the research topics there. The user's experience really needs to be optimized in terms of reliability, what works, what doesn't work. Um, I think that um, here the Institute has a real special opportunity. Telecommunications is going to be an essential part of a new energy system. If we're trying to balance supply and demand, being able to communicate about whether we have more supply or more demand at the moment is very important. Um, and then characterization, I think, is a very good topic for universities. Um, an example of this is that the unique capability here with the collimated light source, which um, yesterday we heard can be useful for characterizing PV on the car roofs that's um, not a flat surface. So that's just one example, but there are many other characterization techniques. And one, too, that we haven't talked too much about, um, I think that there's a really unique um, capability here in the Institute between both understanding optics and understanding um, how cells work and bringing that together once you have good material quality, being able to understand photon recycling and how you um, design the internal optics of the cell to minimize the, um, the lost radiation um, can, so now you're looking, historically we've looked at reducing non-radiative recombination losses, now can we reduce radiative recombination losses? Um, it's an interesting way to look and I think that the Institute is uniquely positioned to do that. 
So um, finally, thank you for your attention and congratulations to the Institute for a wonderful four decades. Thank you so much, sir. I think you've left a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas for us to debate and to reflect. I don't know if there's some comment questions. Thank you for, for a very uh, interesting talk, very, very exciting to, to listen to what you were proposing. I have um, one, one question. I would like to, to know your, your opinion. We are usually uh, discussing high efficiency approaches and a system with very high efficient uh, yield. So we, get, we generate energy from just one solar panel. But um, maybe it's also, uh, maybe it also makes sense that we start thinking on uh, producing less energy from the same panel, but producing that at different hours during the day. Um, for example, this uh, duck here from California, what about uh, placing solar panels in the east to west to produce electricity at different hours. Uh, what about uh, putting solar panels in areas which are not optimal, but since they are cheap, uh, maybe they really can contribute to <coughs> transition. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. this kind of oh, definitely. Um, pointing them to the west is, is a good idea in locations that have air conditioning loads. Certainly, the, the duck curve shows that the real challenge is when the sun sets and then the air conditioners are running full force in the summer. That's a good challenge. Then the question, um, when I, I recently moved into a house that is, is um, kind of out in the country, and so we're looking at 100% electrification, and when we look at that, we find that we actually get the biggest um, load in the winter when we're needing to, to warm the house. And then the, the maximum load comes at midnight. So if you can figure out how to solve that one, that would be really good. But yes, I think um, at facing different directions to be able to balance it out. Um, tracking, um, actually, I've, I've seen people say, let's put them vertically, and then they don't get so dirty. And then you get that morning sun and the, and the evening sun, and you put that together with some that are facing upwards, and then you get a better, a better balance in the curve. Yeah, those are all good things to look at. Um, I have a very specific question uh, regarding also like the California topic. Um, recently in Spain, we have finally approved a um, uh, law for self-consumption uh, self of PV, uh, which is net billing, basically. I know California has been very successful uh, for many years with a net metering uh, uh, scheme. So I was wondering if this uh, Stop of the this estimation of the increase in the power installation in California has only happened in the large plants or also on the rooftops, and if this is due to a change in the policy. So it's happened mainly at the utility scale, and actually a significant fraction of it can be explained by the increased curtailment. Um, but the um, the rooftop, uh, California has actually passed a law that all new um, homes that are built need to have, well, maybe not all, but unless they have some exemption, um, they, the new solar homes have to have solar built onto the roof. Um, they, the, uh, California has taken a slightly different approach, which I actually highly applaud, that they have retained net metering, even at the very high levels of penetration, but they are forcing all of the solar electric customers to go onto time of use rates. And just to make sure people understand, so historically in California, you paid maybe twice as much for electricity in the middle of the day if you had a time of use rate, a difference between peak and off peak. And so when you put in the PV panel, if you paid more in the middle of the day than in the evening, your PV system was very valuable to you. Now the, they have shifted the window of the peak rate so that it's at the late afternoon, about the time the sun is setting, and so now the, the PV plant generates electricity when the rate is low instead of at high. So now the, the PV system isn't as valuable. And that's actually a problem with the economics that people are finding now that in some cases 
um, the, the solar panels aren't as useful to them as they had thought they would be when they looked at the original rates. But it gives the, the ability to maintain. It, um, I, I once, um, the, the SIA, uh, the Solar Energy Industry Association in the US, once set the goal of PV on every rooftop and net metering everywhere. And if you think about that, if your goal is to generate all the electricity on the rooftops um, and not have to pay for that electricity, therefore, then it leaves the utility with the job of running all the power lines around with no income. And that's just not a workable solution. But if you do it this way, so that the customers have to pay more for the electricity after the sun sets than what they, they generate during the day, then that actually fixes the income problem. And now the, the utility gets paid at a fair rate because you adjust the rate of the peak and off-peak rates to be able um, to give what that, the, the true cost is of delivering the electricity at those hours. Um, so the, um, I think the shift so that was a complicated answer. Hopefully that answered your question more or less. Well, um, I, I wanted to, to ask a question myself. So first of all, thank you for that uh, very beautiful talk. And I wanted to ask about um, material scarcity. In talking uh, about uh, the uh, industry, will, will it be any, any problem in, uh, regarding the new emerging technologies, um, talking about the availability of the materials. For instance, in, in the third sky um, technology or in the cannon porcelain um, or any other uh, possible high potential technology, future technology, will, will it be any scarcity uh, um, problem? So my personal opinion about this um, goes back to, I, many of you remember when there were conferences on peak oil and people, I remember um, scientists literally being in tears about the challenge of that if the output of the world of oil peaked and then started to decrease and the world demand for uh, energy continued to go up that we would have this gap that was going to create wars and all kinds of problems. And what we see now is that technology has been developed to be able to uh, extract more oil than what we had before. So the scarcity issue becomes an, is, a, is a, a problem that will help to select between the different things. And for silicon, the primary problem is the silver at this point. Um, I personally don't see either gallium arsenide or perovskites growing fast enough. They, the thickness of the layers that you need for those are so small um, that assuming that you do them in a thin film mode where you're only talking about something on the order of a micrometer, um, I think the business challenges are bigger than the scarcity issues there. But if you did get to the level where you needed it, I think the technology could evolve. So what we saw with silicon, I remember people back in the 90s talking about a problem with the silicon availability. And what we saw was that there was a one-time glitch at the point where the demand for PV silicon exceeded the demand for microelectronics silicon, it caught the industry by surprise, and they weren't prepared to deal with it. But ever since then, they've been able to deal with it. So I think the same thing would happen with the scarcity, that if we got onto a trajectory where we really needed something more, we would develop the technology to be able to extract it, or we would see an evolution toward an alternative. The technology has been able to handle that pretty well so far, and it is possible that in a very fast growth scenario, um, it's probable that we would see glitches, but I don't think that in the end scarcity will prevent us from reaching the terawatt scale deployment that we would need to be able to power the world with solar. That's my personal opinion. Uh, there probably are those in the room who would um, be more concerned about it. And certainly it's hotly debated. Thank you very much, first of all, for your very inspiring presentation. Uh, you mentioned several times storage. I would like to ask first if the situation that you mentioned uh, in one of the answers that the users are not seeing so much value on PV because of the change in the time of use tariff, is that fostering the demand on local storage? And uh, second question would be, what's your opinion between or 
the, the combination that you would uh, advise on centralized and decentralized storage. So that's a very big topic that I have actually a lot of opinions about. So first thing, yes, storage beginning to include batteries into systems is um, the current fad in the US. And the most exciting thing I see happening there, Xcel Energy, um, which is a utility that supplies electricity for something like six states, it's a very large territory. They recently discovered they came up with something they call steel for fuel. And if you think about it, the investors, the investor-owned utilities are there to supply the capital investment for building a plant. If there's an operating cost, like the cost of the natural gas, that gets passed on to the ratepayer in real time. But the investor's money is needed where you invest up front and then you get back the return over decades later. And what they looked at was to see that if you invest in solar or wind, you're investing in the upfront plant. So they call that the steel, although it's not all steel. The racks maybe have the steel in them. And the ongoing operating costs are much less for the renewable plants than, than the rest. And what they found is that if they include even a couple of hours, one or two hours of battery storage, they can count the um, new plant toward their target of meeting the uh, peak power demand in the middle of the summer, whenever their peak demand is, at a higher level. So they have a formula they use, and they still can't count 100% of the capacity of the plant, but they can count some fraction of it. And by adding battery to a solar system, adding battery to a wind system doesn't do you as much good because the wind may go several days without blowing. But with a solar system, you can almost always charge the batteries and then if you predict that I'm going to be short in this one hour of time in the evening, I can use the batteries to deliver electricity in that time. And so what you see is that the utilities have now made the case that it's in the investor's best interest to invest in renewable solar plants with batteries as their best style investment. And I see now more headlines of the other utilities having heard Excel's story of this is actually good for us, instead of the solar people like us saying, yeah, you should do solar, you should do solar, now the utility, this mainstream utility is saying, hey, you know guys, this is actually the right thing for us to do. And now you see that um, transitioning. But in terms of um, central versus um, local, I see the potential for doing a lot of local storage of heat and um, batteries. So for example, the electric car, unfortunately, right now, the rates in California are such that if you want the really cheap rate for charging electric vehicles, you charge it in the middle of the night, like at midnight. The sun isn't shining at midnight, so why do I want to shine? You know, I'm going to use natural gas generated electricity, maybe, if I'm charging at midnight. But um, so the incentives are not, but the cost to me is essentially nothing to charge during the day instead of charging at midnight. So if we move that way, we could use the local storage in that way very effectively. Similarly, if I have an air conditioner or a heat pump, I could put in a, a tank for ice or for hot water. I can't do that at a centralized level very effectively. I can do that at the localized level. At the same time, we could make very good use of our coal plants if we installed a centralized storage system we have Andrew Blakers in, the, in Australia suggesting we should be using off-river pumped hydro as a major centralized storage mechanism. We also have in the UK a group that's doing liquid air storage where they take the air and compress it down to the point and, and store it in a cryogenic plant and then later on, and if you took one of those plants and put it in a coal-fired plant, you would be able to preserve the jobs from the local coal-fired plant and use the infrastructure of you bringing the electricity in and out. So I see opportunities to do storage both at a centralized and a, a decentralized approach. And I see that there's a huge opportunity there to understand what are the best options. So sorry, that was a long answer, but it's a fascinating question, I think. Thank you, Sarah, for such a nice presentation. I was curious about the policy mistakes. You comment that 
we try to convince all the actors to go to this uh, booth. But there seems to be a lot of momentum to, to that approach. Um, which are the reasons for doing that in Europe? We are somehow moving in that direction. We are the condition in the states, which are the condition of the policy actors to do that to that and to, to push that approach. So I think if you look at the data, it actually supports their approach at the moment that um, if you looked at the data, you saw that the centralized plants are what's driven the large expansion. The, the smaller size systems haven't contributed to the major growth of, of solar electricity. Um, I think in the US also, we have more land. You've seen in California how we have big expanses that you can just put out big systems. And the idea, if you go to Singapore, the people in Singapore are like, you know, how are we going to do solar if we don't put it on roofs? You know, we don't have any place, maybe floating PV is the way we'll do it. But um, so I think in Europe, there's maybe a less um, large expansions of land, although I think Spain maybe has, has more resource of, of land than um, some of the other places. But um, I, I'm not sure why they haven't been open to it, and maybe they will eventually, but mainly their viewpoint is that I think it's too high risk, that it will never work. You saw in 1994, they launched the product and it's never taken off. And so what is the, what's the probability that we would be able to develop the technology that would actually scale to a terawatt scale as opposed to you know, kilowatts here and there on the trucks or whatever? Um, so they may be actually right. I don't know. I think it's a high risk approach, but I see the possibility that we could get there. And for a university um, environment, it's actually good to look at some of the high risk things that are not mainstream of what the companies are doing so that we're not competing directly with the companies. But maybe all of you are already convinced, so I didn't need to, to this, do the sales job. So for this beautiful talk, uh, I would like to, to ask you, about your opinion about uh, why we have seen in the latest, I would say, 10 years or something, extraordinary efforts in research for uh, energy like the fusion energy or in the US, the laser emission facility, the ITER in Europe, which implies a lot of money invested in that, in that uh, kind of energy and not in the solar field, for example, which requires, I think, less. What's your opinion about that uh, research? So you Next. mean, like Bill Gates is looking at nuclear over solar, right? Is that the sort of thing you're thinking of? Okay, yes, yes. Yes. Well, I don't agree with Bill Gates, but, and I, I heard him give a talk um, last year in which he said that the solar and wind people who are claiming that we can power the world with variable sources of electricity are more dangerous than the climate deniers. So that all put us in our place, huh? Um, so we're dangerous people here. But um, I, I mean, he has actually, you know, I was in Chicago during one of the, the really the polar blasts where it's like really, really, really cold. And um, it happened that I had flown in on the airport. I'd forgotten to bring a hat coming from California. You know, it's not, it's pretty warm. And so you don't think about these things. And here I was standing on a corner waiting for a bus. Um, 20 minutes later, I was very cold and thinking about this and thinking, you know, if we had a world that was just driven by solar and wind, how would we deal with this polar blast that's like in January or something? And there's not that much solar, there's not that much wind. And here now you have this city that's really frigid, really cold. How would we deal with this? It's a problem. We don't have a solution for it yet. And so that's a research opportunity. How do we make a system that can deal with that variable um, variable source of electricity. So I think they actually have a point that we haven't solved that problem. I, I think that we can solve that problem. So my view of it is we should work on solving that problem. But in the meantime, we definitely have people who are thinking that nuclear is just really convenient because you can 
set it up and it generates a lot of electricity. Um, certainly France has done very well with the nuclear over the years. Um, so I don't know, that's not a very satisfying answer for you. There are just different opinions out there. But I think often, I, I know of some scientists in the US I talk to, who like, I don't wanna hear about storage. You know, We can do it with solar, solar will do it. But the fact is at midnight, the sun is not shining. And I wanna be able to turn on the lights. And I think when you think about it, although I can charge my electric car during the day when the sun is shining, there are times when there isn't a plug nearby in the middle of the day and I wanna be able to charge the car. And as a society, do, do we think that the world will accept solar with the idea that, well, we'll have it when the sun is shining and when the sun's not shining, then we'll have it if we have enough storage, but if we didn't build in enough storage, then maybe we'll run out some days. People are not gonna accept that very well. And it's something we as a solar community are like, well, well you know, we'll figure it out. But we haven't figured it out yet. We need to do that if we want the whole world to accept it. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have to uh, close this interesting debate. The good thing is that it's not a uh, close debate, it's an open debate, and we will have uh, days, uh, years uh, to continue discussing these things. So thank you very much, Sarah.